You're listening to Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. Guys, we are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes Radio. If you enjoy the show, we would love a click on the subscribe button on iTunes. Positive comments also help us out. And as always, you can go on OutoftheBoxPodcast.com and click on the donate button. We're now accepting Litecoins and Bitcoins and all alternative currency, and we would love for your support on the podcast. I'm here today with Jackie Rigoni. She runs a really cool blog called Post Consumer Life and is part of the growing tiny house movement. Jackie, how are you doing today? Doing great, Rosie. Nice to be talking to you. Thanks for having me. Now, I know you're no longer in a tiny house. You're actually traveling about. Are you back on the West Coast or where where have you ended up these days? Yeah, right now I'm back in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I guess you could say I'm in a tiny house by my neighbor's standards. I um, <laughs> okay. so rented a, a 900 square foot home and there's uh, five of us. So it's pretty small by Bay Area standards. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your blog and how you got involved in the tiny house movement. For So for those of you who are listening, who are like, what is she talking about? Right. Um, the tiny house movement is a movement of kind of anti-consumerism, consumerism, simplification of life. Um, how would you describe it? Right. I would say um, I think it's people who come to question the increasing size of homes and realize that as humans, we really don't need the ginormous homes that most of us live in, or most in the middle class, I should say. And so really, it's the idea of downsizing to the least amount of space that you need to live in and consequently be a lot happier. Well, it's, I would say it's downsizing to upsize, right? So you're downsizing in material items, space, um, a house that maybe you can't afford or can't pay for or are working this crazy life to pay for, and you're upgrading to a better quality of life. Is that is that what you would, uh, would say? Yeah, definitely. It's the idea, and it definitely comes with some challenges, but I, say, I would say overall that's, that's definitely the goal. And um, I think that's probably what most people, including myself, have found, it, that it's really liberating and it's really about coming to your life um, creatively and thinking about re- really reevaluating what, uh, what you've taken for granted in order to, like you said, upsize your life and make it better for yourself. Now, how did you get involved in this? Were you living the typical, you know, nine to five um kids in school, big house, overextended mortgage, and you thought this is enough? Or what, what was the process? Yeah, well, um, I guess, um, oh, I guess it's a, it was a long road. We definitely, my husband and I found ourselves living um, in a 2,000 square foot home in the Bay Area, which um, if any of you live in the Bay Area, no, that means you have at least a million dollar mortgage. Uh, we're both working. We're not. Uh, we're not rich. Uh, that which meant we were working very hard to pay that mortgage. And now, is that the average price of a house in the Bay Area? That's no. I'm not quite sure the median price, but it sure seems like what that's what homes are going for. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, you can't find much uh, much lower than that compared to the rest of the country. Yeah. Um, and so we just, you know, we were doing well in our jobs, but my husband is an electrician and I'm a writer, so it's not like, um, you know, we're, we're tech entrepreneurs or anything and have this <laughs> gigantic castle or anything. There is a stereotype of San Francisco around the world that it's just all these young, hip, multi-million dollar, you know, tech company owners and things. So that's good that you clarify that. <laughs> right, right. I mean... Every area still needs uh, teachers and ACE hardware workers and, <laughs> you know, so that, you know, and that's the problem is that it, you know, the, for the, for the people who just have a you know, regular jobs, it really, you really end up just waking up in the morning and going to work to pay a mortgage. And um, at, at a certain point, my husband and I started homeschooling our, our oldest daughter in kindergarten. We hadn't expected to homeschool, but uh, we, we ended up doing that when, when these great public schools that we were buying into because of our 
um, you know, with a large mortgage, you, you presume that you're going to be getting into great school areas. Well, our local public school wasn't, just really wasn't all that great. And so we found ourselves homeschooling. Um, and so, and I was still writing at the time too, and I, I still am, but we, all of a sudden that allowed us to question, start questioning everything. Um, and so we just, just started to, we looked at each other and, and just thought, what, why are we doing this and what other options are available? So, um, I, I tend to research everything and, um, came upon a bunch of information about the tiny homes movement. My husband and I went to a workshop, um, and we just started realizing that that was something we wanted to do. So, um, after... Oh, it was probably, I think, I think the hardest part for us was actually deciding to take that leap of faith, faith and, and sell our home. Um, but once we did it, that it was, it was full speed ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> what were your kids thinking? Were they just like, oh my God, mom and dad, you guys have lost it. Or were they like, okay, this is going to be cool. You know what they, I think they got a little bit of adventure in them. And so, <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, and I think part of it, I think they were bummed to leave our next door neighbors, but I think they kind of pick up cues from from the people around them and they knew we were really excited about it and they we made them a part of the entire process so we would look at property look at land and go look at um and they were with us 100 percent of the way so we ended up buying uh, nine acres of land um, which is still in the bay area just a little bit outside of san jose in the um still in silicon valley area um, but for way, way less than what we were paying. Um, and uh, we, over the course of uh, about a year and a half, we put up a geodesic dome from a kit. Um, it, when we first got there, we plopped an RV on there. Um, we, it's completely off-grid. Um, so we had no running water and no electricity and... Um, but we were, you know, little by little, we were able to get it up and running. Um, my, it's handy to have an electrician (laughs) when you need such things. And so, um, we pretty quickly got up some solar panels for very basic electrical needs. Um, and I think within a week I had, a I had high speed (laughs) Wi-Fi. (laughs) um and we put up a we put up a dish uh to be able to connect to wi-fi and tapped it to the manzanita tree and (laughs) so so we had wi-fi which i needed for my for my writing and telecommuting and what what about uh water are you guys doing well water or did you guys what what's the people previously who had the land and were just using it recreationally, they had uh, put up t- 10,000 gallon storage tanks. Okay. And so we actually had water and you know, last year was a drought in Cali- in Northern California. So um, we, we were able to use the water all there. We ran out two weeks before the winter rains came. Um, but then we just got a water truck to come out and pump water in there. So um, we found that pretty much all of the stuff that we all just take for granted as far as opening the tap and water coming out and, you know, plugging things in that and you get electricity um, and, and we pay so much for that stuff, right? I mean, your cable and your electricity that we we ended up being completely self-sufficient for those things. And so that was really an eye opener and, and liberating and empowering <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> um, to be to to take charge of all of that stuff and realize that you can you can be responsible for all of that stuff. Um, so it 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 was very hard, I have to say. Um, first of all, where we lived was amazing. It, it and we still have the property. Um, I'm talking about in the past tense because I'm not there right now. Um, but 
it was it's just beautiful we we had a pond we have um the kids watch the life cycle of frogs and and identified tracks of animals and we just learned all we learned so much and the kids learned so many awesome hands-on skills for and helped us build and they were getting back to nature <laughs> yeah and and not just that, but I mean, really useful hands-on skills, like how do you hold a saw? How do you sand something? How do you, you know, they were right there with us building. Um, and so I feel like we we were modeling for them wh- what it what it's like to have the skills that people had really 100 years ago, which was people built their own homes. <laughs> yeah, basic life <laughs> skills, right? <laughs> And we've all totally lost those skills, and we've outsourced those to specialists, and we and we've come to believe that we cannot do that ourselves. But we found out that you can. And and Reese is an electrician, but he he's you know he's not a carpenter, and neither am I. We're both really handy, and we're great figure outers. But um, it, you know, trial and error is a great. Uh, it's a great way to learn, <laughs> so, <laughs> as is YouTube. <laughs> well, thank God for YouTube because I'm sure that helped you out a lot, and also the internet because there's just, you know, it just amazes me how much information is out there, and and you can just Google it or find. Anytime I think that there's something that can't be done or somebody hasn't done something, I'll look it up and realize that 10 other people already thought of it before you me. You are <laughs> so right. That, I think that was basically key to, to our success. That and the fact that the people who lived near us, our, our neighbors, which by neighbor I mean someone who lives a mile away, uh, <laughs> are these awesome mountain folk who – have the answer to any challenge you could possibly think of. You want to figure out how to get a gate uh, that's tipping to to open smoothly. You know, you just ask one of these guys, and they have, they have the answer for you. It's really <laughs> unbelievable how these folks have you know know how to live up there in ways that folks in the city don't really 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 know. So. Do you feel like you're ready for the zombie apocalypse, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, that definitely, I mean, really did talk a, a lot about that is, you know, it, it, you could call it that or you could call it a major earthquake, right? Yeah. Where, right? Where what would happen, you, you know, now that we're back closer to civilization, we're so dependent on our water and power and, you know, out there, we would have been just fine. Um, and so I guess food would have come into play at a certain point because we weren't hunting or anything like that. (laughs) Do you guys have any livestock or chickens or anything out there? Like a lot of, I know a lot of tiny house people have small vegetable gardens. Yeah, we, we definitely tried our hand at gardening and that was, you know, more, more hard lessons learned, but (laughs) you know, like the deer are really really uh adept at getting through fencing and <laughs> <laughs> we managed to get some fava beans and some tomatoes but um you know it, it took we we didn't have a a really amazing crop let's just say <laughs> <laughs> so it was trial and error and some yes, error <laughs> more error than trial i guess <laughs> and then um we we definitely planned to get chickens uh but there's so much there are so many predators out there that i didn't want to do that until we got we we could build a major fort knox against predators and and i think our own housing situation took priority over the chickens so we didn't quite get to that stage well let's talk about that so you said that you and your husband built a house from a kit now some of you know this is a tiny house um, podcast. Mm-hmm. It's just a podcast, so yeah. some some people might not know what that means. Right. So um, there are actually a ton of options for building your own home if you don't have the 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 skills to actually build it from the ground up, like carpentry <laughs> skills. You mean? Yeah. I mean, you you definitely need to learn those along the way. But I mean, in terms of just building a uh, a brick and mortar or stick house from from the ground up because I mean there are more temporary type options such as yurts um, and some there's some cabana kits you can buy a lot of people build uh, tiny homes uh, that are just smaller homes built on uh, trailer beds 
Um, and uh, what we ultimately decided on was a geodesic dome, which is built on a platform, a wooden platform that we built ourselves. And then it's a, it's a steel frame and a vinyl covering. Um, it is, it's a really cool structure. It supposedly, is supposed to, supposedly maximizes um, your square footage because of its really cool geometry and um, it was not that hard to put up so we actually had it up in a few months and so and you guys lived in the rv while you were preparing we, exactly exactly so but i think in retrospect i would not go we wouldn't go that route because what really had us moving back to civilization was the 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 first winter we were there uh it was um it was relatively mild. And then this past winter, it just got really rainy and really cold. And what we found out was that a geodesic dome um, in a lot of rain and cold, where it's warm on the inside and cold and humid on the outside, you're, you realize you're living in a greenhouse. Okay. <laughs> so, so literally, we were getting dripped on uh, <laughs> in the nighttime. And so... That combined with a few other things, I mean, we, we, we didn't have, we had gotten rid of the RV and we were living just fine in the dome. We built an outdoor kitchen and this, I have pictures of this on, in my blog too, because I think it's really cool to see that, that it, it's not a hard thing to do. Uh, so, and that really that kids can take part in it and learn, learn so much too. Um, so we had an outdoor kitchen. We had, we still have an outdoor kitchen and, um, you know, with sink, we got, we had, we built an outhouse with a composting toilet. Uh, we use you guys we had, the peat, peat moss. Uh, it, we would just go to the, the local, um, hardware store and get, uh, sawdust for oh, free. Okay. Yeah, we used sawdust. And then um, using gravity, our tanks were up a hill. Our water tanks were up a hill. And so using gravity feed, we would were able to get a really great pressure shower um, and, and uh, with propane heat, have hot showers. And so we were, we were living pretty well there until the winter hit. And, and, it, and then a couple other things such as a, an invasion of mice. <laughs> okay. that, we could, that I tried not you know I, I really tried to not kill the mice and I, I researched uh, humane mouse traps and I just insisted on, on not killing these mice because we were uh, in their home and but I think that allowed the mouse situation to get out of control because then we'd find mouse poop on top of the humane mouse trap <laughs> <laughs> and the mice so, the mice were like f you jackie we're yes. here to stay <laughs> oh my god every morning i swear i tried so many <laughs> devices to try to get rid of the mice until i finally then that's what what first they invaded the rv and then so then <laughs> i said okay we're moving into the dome and then they they found their way in there and so kind of there's this convergence of you know the greenhouse effect plus mice plus cold weather and rain and it just yeah I after a year and a half I finally said okay we need to find a livable situation at, you know as the water's dripping on our children's faces during their sleep and so <laughs> you guys got pushed out by mice that's funny <laughs> yes so we ended up renting a very small home, to, you know, compared to other other standards, um, 900 square feet. But the beautiful thing was um, we had already downsized so much of our stuff. Um, it, I, I was able then to just in probably the just about a month furnish the whole place with free stuff from Craigslist. Um, and so that was a really enlightening thing too, is that I feel like I just, there's just this awesome resource out there for, for free <laughs> furniture and people giving away stuff left and right. Probably people who are downsizing to live in tiny homes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask you now, this is a huge change for most people. And 
Um, did you get any pushback from people or judgments? And you sound like a pretty open-minded person. So I'm assuming that you're surrounding yourself with those types of people that are also open-minded. But I mean, this is a big move for a lot of people. So did you get any like negative negativity or pushback? Yeah, that's a really great question. Because like I said, I think the hardest thing was really to recalibrate our thinking because the people around us are, you know, it's kind of what you do. You you get a job, you, you get a job, you get married, you have kids, you buy a house, you buy a bigger house. It was just kind of we're surrounded by that thinking. Um, but I think people who know me kind of just say, well, that's just Jackie. There goes Jackie again, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I don't think anyone was too surprised. We had a lot of, we had mixed reactions. Some people saying, you know, you guys are nuts. And um, Mauricio's parents were pretty disappointed that we were giving up our, our sweet home. Uh, but, but I think uh, for the most part, we were surprised by how many people said, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to do that. And so that made me think, wow, there are a lot of people out there who have these ideas of things they want to do with their lives, but they don't have the courage to just try. And the beautiful thing I think that I found out through this process, first of all, it was a year and a half and I kind of, I'm still trying to process what it meant to me to try it and then to, to walk away for a bit because I feel like, oh, did I quit? Am I a, was it a failure? Um, you know, am I, am I wimping out? But, um, a few things I think, first of all, I think, uh, well, um, Thoreau was only a year on Walden Pond, so I feel like... <laughs> I was going to mention Thoreau and, uh, when you were because you were talking about going back to nature, and that was his whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah, and he only spent a year out there, so I, I have him beat. <laughs> that was one thing, but I think the other point is that when we moved out there, we thought. Okay, what happens if we absolutely hate it? What happens if the kids hate it? What happens if it's, you know, what, what if it doesn't work? What if we can't do it? There's so many what ifs that I think can hold you back from actually doing something like that. But we thought, okay, what's the worst that could happen? We, we hate it. It doesn't work. And we can always get a big fat mortgage again if we ever really <laughs> wanted to, right? So there's really not a whole lot to lose by trying. And I feel like... The whole experience has been amazing because what I was going to say earlier was once we once I furnished this this little rental home, the kids walked in and the first thing they did as they're running around was said, it's ginormous. <laughs> <laughs> and so our expectations have been so readjusted to what normal is or what we can live in that it really, it makes you realize how little you need <laughs> to be happy. And not only that, that it actually improves your life because it made us really nimble to be able to just move quickly if we needed to. And then, um, you know, just pick up and do what we wanted. It's because, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, now because we're, we homeschool and because our housing situation is, is more open-ended, we um, um, we decided in the beginning of January, I, I got on a train and went with my kids to Chicago to see my family. And then we took a, several weeks and just moseyed our way back, driving, driving across the country, me and the three kids. And so I feel like we're really nimble right now. And I, we each had one little bag of, of clothes. And, we, you know, you just... I can pack in an instant now. You throw, I throw whatever clothes I have in the bag, and I don't have to, you know, ponder which outfit goes with which shoes, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it and it makes you really nimble. And we had the most awesome time. I was able to work on the road, and I'm now starting to see that this is a huge possibility for my family. That now we may end up just 
going on the road and traveling the world and learning and educating the kids that way. So it's well, it sounds like you're a really fun, cool mom. Because <laughs> Could you please well, tell my children that? <laughs> well, it's funny because people have this idea. A lot of people are brainwash, brainwashed with this idea that I need all this money to buy all this stuff to give my family the life that they deserve. Right. Yet most people, when they go back to their childhood, the one thing that they want is to spend time with their family. You know, yes. I remember just wanting to spend time with my parents or play with my parents and they were like, oh, we're too busy or we're working or we're too tired. And uh -huh. I mean, it's like kind of the typical cliche Disney movie or yes. Disney stereotype yes. where the kid just wants to spend time with the parents and the parents, you know, like in Richie Rich or whatever, <laughs> you know, they just want to work and make all this yeah. money and the kids are like, well, uh -huh. dad, I just want to spend time with you. And so yeah. it seems like you know, even if your kids might get irritated with you that you're you're spending all this time with them and yeah. teaching them and they're really being molded to learn and grow the way you would like instead of, you know, so many people have kids and then they're working and then their kids end up being raised by some other person, right. whether it be a nanny or a house sitter or whoever. And so you're not even really raising those kids. Right, right. And I, I think most parents grapple with these questions, so I certainly don't want to judge anyone for their choices of, of how they, they choose to make a living and spend their time, but I can say for me, myself, when I found myself in that situation where I was working and, and putting off my kids, and I, I described, I've described before how I felt like my time with my children feels like uh, water trying to hold water in your cupped hands and yet it's still you know as tightly as you squeeze your fingers together it's still dripping out that that's what it felt like to me with my the time with my kids and that's what prompted us to make such big life-changing decisions and you know I still have to work and I still have to say go you know go play um, mommy's got a deadline you know. <laughs> But I, it really has allowed me the time to be with the kids and to, you know, to say, hey, let's go travel the country for for a month if we want to. And I really feel like it's, um, yeah, it's a really great option if you allow yourself to realize that you do have an option. And you have to get really creative with your life, I think, because I think so often people feel um, bounded by certain expectations, but I think those, they often are illusions of boundaries. Um, That's a very good point. I think there are a lot of illusions in society and what, and you kind of broke one of them, which I constantly talk about on the podcast, which is that we don't need that much to live. You know, you, I always hear people saying, oh, it's so hard to live within your means and well, I just can't make it and I just can't pay the bills. And it's because they're spending money on so much unnecessary crap. Right, right. And and right. and you show that it's you know first of all, if it was so hard to do it, then there, how do the millions and millions of people who, in fact, billions of people around the world who live in poverty do it? That's it's because right. you don't actually need that much stuff to survive. You need food. You need shelter. You need water. A place to use the potty. Like a. Like five things. <laughs> That's all you oh, so true. Yeah, and I think you, I had listened to an earlier podcast of yours. I had also found the same statistic. When we, we looked at our income and we're trying to make ends meet and pay this mortgage, and um, you look at what you're making and you think, we should not be struggling. We should not have debt. This is a lot of money. And we make more than the rest of the world. And so even a median income, even a low income is a lot of money in the rest of the world. The statistic that I read was that if you make over 40,000 a year, then you make then you're in the 1% of the world. Yes. That's right. That's right. And so it really I think once you once you realize that you you do have the money and you do have choices because I think people often fail to see that there are choices. Um, and, and, you know, it's easy to say because I think I'm, you know, I'm, Oh, I, I'm middle income. And so sometimes that's easier to say there are plenty of people, people who are struggling in this country. Um, and so I don't want to presume that everybody can just, you know, up and travel with their kids that there are a lot of people who are really in a dire situation. But I think 
you know, there are also a lot of people who think they're in a dire situation. There are. There's a lot of people who think that they are in a a lose-lose situation and they're not realizing the amount of abundance they have in their life. And so what you're saying is that there's an alternative to the consumer lifestyle that's out there and you're showing that it's okay to do it and actually that it's more rewarding. And I wanted to talk about that because um, you talk about the downgrade. How um, liberating was it when you started to sell the stuff and downgrade? Did you feel like you were letting go of like a lot of unnecessary crap? Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm ne- I have never been a pack rat. I imagine it might be harder for people who are who are pack rats. So I've never I've never had that problem. Um, I think some of the harder things were judging what which sentimental things to keep. Um, and I so I I had to get really picky about which of those things I would keep. And I I still have more than I I wish to have. And I still and I also have stuff creep. So it's it's not like you get rid of stuff and you downsize one time and then you're done with it. It's a constant process of keeping uh, keeping crap out of your house. You know? <laughs> in fact, I keep in my front door closet. I keep a basket of uh, for goodwill. J- uh, just, you know, I keep loading it up and keep taking stuff because it just, Oh my God, you sound like me. We have a, <laughs> we have a bag that we change out. It, we use our paper grocery bags in LA. Plastic bags are illegal at the grocery store. Now yeah. they got lobbed them. Right. So we, we use reusable bags, but sometimes we'll forget to bring our reusables in the grocery store. will give us a paper bag and we leave it by the door for goodwill stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is a. I think it'll be a lifelong process um, of of just purging. So, um, but and I'll, I I do want to say too for the kids, I have to. You know, there are times where they want a toy or they want something where in the past that I would I would get it for them. Um, so what I do now is I'll say, well, put it on your birthday list, or you know, and I I just. I don't just buy stuff for them anymore. And then also I talk to them in different terms, which is I choose not to spend my money on that right now. And (laughs) so I want them to know that (laughs) that it is a choice, right? That it's not like, no, I don't know. I'm not going to get that for you. Or I am choosing not to spend my money on this now so that we do have money to travel or, you know, and I make sure that the messaging is clear that I, We are choosing how to spend our money, you know, instead of just saying, no, we're not getting that and not explaining to them what is going on. Right. Or or saying, oh, sure. Yes, this just this one time. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So but it is hard. Right. I mean, because you kind of get used to this way of thinking, well, and even for ourselves, right, even without kids, it's like, you know, oh, buy books on Amazon. You you know, these are the books are good things to buy. Right. (laughs) <laughs> but you have a library down the street that has that book, and if it doesn't have it, you can you can request it, and it'll be there. In the day, you know, I mean, all these things we think we need to buy, we don't. <laughs> you know, well, there can, you can also do a. Um, we have an in and out policy at my house, so whenever something new is purchased, something needs to go out. So that actually yeah. controls my in and out. And my husband and I came up with this when we decluttered our house. Yeah. And um, we also have, so if I, if I want something new, if I want new shoes, then he'll say, all right, well, what are you going to give away? Ooh, I like <laughs> it. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's great. what the, that's what the Goodwill bag is for. And we also, yeah. um, you know, we'll, we'll do certain things to, to keep things even because otherwise you keep accu- accumulating more stuff and stuff doesn't go out. If we buy a book, you know, we, as soon as we're done with it, we, we'll usually repost it on Amazon and sell it. So. Yeah, right, right, exactly. exactly. So it's an in and out, in and out, constant in and out. But I think that this is a great, great thing that you're doing, Jackie, because it's teaching you to be self-sufficient. And, you know, myself, I'm from New Orleans. I wasn't there when Hurricane Katrina happened, but that happened. And Hurricane Sandy and all these natural disasters that are coming because of, you know, whether they're man-made or not. And so you, there may be a time when people need to learn to be self-sufficient. And so you've taught your kids that, which is a very valuable tool. And, you know, most people are lost if they can't find their cell phone. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And I, I mean, it, I still, I mean, it's not like I'm some 
backwoods mama or something. I still live in Silicon Valley. I still have, depend on my cell phone for communication. I still have Wi-Fi. I still, you know, there, so you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's very, you know, weak, but I also know that those things are, are choices, right? It's not like I, we have to have those things. So, um, and I, well, what I say about my kids is that either they're going to be like, forest rangers or they're, <laughs> or they're gonna live they're gonna rebel and live in some high rise in new york city and, and have this you know awesome flat that's fully furnished and they're gonna you know go the opposite of what i hope for them so <laughs> so well, well, well either ways you've given them the tools so they can make their own choice <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i hope so Whereas some people, I don't think they feel like they have a choice in it. I want to bring up, uh, you know, you mentioned Thoreau and and that brought, I was going to say something about that because he talked about going back to nature and there's been a lot of, uh, I don't know if it's all of the technology that we have with internet and TV and cable and ads and, and so much entertainment where people are there's another back to nature movement now, just like in the early 1900s. And I want to know, did you feel more connected did you feel a sense a different sense when you were in nature versus you know being in the city when yes. you spent that year and a half yes hands down yes we I'll bet you right now most people maybe even you don't even know what phase of the moon it is right now or where the moon is rising or what time it's rising tonight I, I don't know but I think my mom would know she's really into that <laughs> and and when you're living really literally outside, you become acutely aware of such things or of the cycles and everything. Exactly. Right? And, and watching the seasons turn and, um, um, where, um, Oh, I'll give you an example. Well, there's, there's, I wrote a story on my blog about this, our, one of our neighbors who brought us over, a, a this little Turkey chick, a wild Turkey chick that, her dog had caught in its mouth and and the dog uh, so she brought it to us and said you guys like like nature here you take care of it <laughs> and was this when you guys were still yeah when we were still out there and so okay um and and so you know of course I do a quick internet search what do wild turkeys eat and it turns out they like crickets and my son Giovanni was saying oh I know where the crickets are and he was able to go out to a certain part of our land where there were a bunch of crickets and find crickets to feed this turkey. <laughs> okay. he, like they really knew that area of our land. They knew, you know, could identify footprints. And I just, uh, yeah, I feel like I, I'm really into nature anyway. So I had already been spending time hiking and camping with the kids beforehand, but I s- definitely feel like I was much more, uh, much more connected. And I feel like we've definitely lost a lot of that when we stay just in, you know, go from our car to our house, to the store, to the, you know, all these inside places, or maybe we might go for a walk or a hike every once in a while. But it's that day to day, um, cycle and change that that I think we felt really close to and my kids can totally my oldest daughter especially can identify so many constellations and and she would track Scorpio as it was moving across the summer sky and these are just things that I didn't even teach them it's just stuff that they notice oh mom look at look at Scorpio moved over there now and you're like, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Last night it was over there. Now look how it's moving over there. You know, so just really cool to see when you give yourself the time and put yourself out there to observe. Did you kind of feel like Pocahontas out there a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's lots of them. I mean, there's so many, so many ups and downs. And and it really, boy, it, it challenges, challenges you in so many different ways. So I, I don't think I was nearly as graceful as Pocahontas. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some of the ups and downs? I haven't, you know, been in a tiny house. I live in a very small, um, dwelling in the city and my husband are, me and my husband are minimalists, Yeah, but we're not, um, in that world. So what were some of the challenges that you were experiencing? Right. Well, I, 
I would think the thing that I think most people probably think is the hardest was the least hard for us. And that's that you think in a very small space that you, you know, you feel cramped. But because we live, our space was in the middle of the outdoors. Basically, we had a nine acre home. And so I don't think we ever felt like, oh, this is too tiny or this is too, you know, we feel cramped at all. And I think that's that might be some people's expectation. Um, so I think the harder challenges were just kind of the simple things of the, the things we all take for granted. And this, I don't know if this is true for everybody in a tiny home who might be more connected to the grid. This is more connected to out off grid living is that the things you take for granted, like having water anytime you need it is <laughs> it, you do not take that for granted. And you know, it just, it, water can be really hard <laughs> and um you know and if there's a storm and you- is it is it because you guys had to um watch the reserve or what yep. what was making it hard yeah we we had to watch how much water we were using and because there was a drought we didn't know that when the next rain would come to fill the tanks and so you know we watched the water level going down 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 <laughs> and um, <laughs> so we reached a point like i told you where we were two weeks without water and we would go down to the creek and fill up some water so that we could you know heat it up to bathe with and to um, you know, and to wash dishes and stuff like that. So but- now, was there a filter system on the tank or how did yeah, you guys we had, we okay. had filters? Yeah. We didn't drink the water. We bought, we would bring in drinking water. So it was fine for showering and, and for washing dishes and stuff like that, but we didn't drink it. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it was just those things. And surprisingly, cause I'm, like I said, I'm a total outdoorsy person. I never thought mice would get to me that much. <laughs> I'm serious. I, it, that was the thing that got me the most. So, it, oh, and, and wasps and mosquitoes. So if you had told, asked me beforehand what was the, you know, what was going to be hard, I would have thought, you know, living in a smaller space, uh, my kids would get on my nerves and or too small. No, that's not it. It was really just the realities of living living close to nature and, you know, have poison ivy, their poison oak, I should say, and things like that. So it was, it was some <laughs> kind of just the, those things, I think that made it hard. Um, and, but, but do you think you, if you were in a cabin type environment, instead of the um, dwelling that you're in, it would have been different? Yeah, I do. I think if we had just kind of some of the basic livability of a of a cabin like you said with some insulation um and a better heating system and that it was closed i think it would have been i think we'd still be there um and and we that we kind of switched the plan to building something more along those lines so you're going to be back we'll see unless i'm traveling <laughs> which seems like a really great new option cuz i <laughs> i've tried that out and that was really cool but now i've i've really i've always traveled or before i i had kids i traveled and i was in the peace corps so i i lived abroad uh, you know, and I studied abroad and I love to travel. So I feel like now I want to be able to do that with my kids while they're still young and, and, um, still want to be with me. So (laughs) (laughs) before they turn 15 and 16, like way too cool for you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, well, I, I think I'm at a transition point right now in my life. I'm not quite sure what the next thing is. I can tell you it will involve travel. I can tell you it will always involve less stuff. Um, I, and the liberation that comes with that. Um, cause that's been quite a revelation and, um, but you don't seem like someone that would be materialistic to begin with and have all this stuff. Um, I wouldn't say materialistic, but I really, I like design. The, um, the house that our, our big fancy house that we lived in was, uh, was designed by, a, an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was this really 
cool home. So I really like mid-century modern design. So I, you know, it's not like it, I, I don't know if I'd call it materialism because, you know, I'm, I'm cool driving around in an old pickup truck and I, <laughs> I've never been one, to, I guess, who's super materialistic, but you know, I think you get, shoot, I've, I've, I used to go get my nails done at a salon, and now I think about who was that person. You, know? <laughs> like, what? you maybe you were just um, you are you are who you were now, but you were just a little bit more maybe unconscious to the consumerism. I think you're. I think you've put um, put your finger on it. I think what happens is we just kind of we live around, surrounded by it, and so you don't really think twice about it. You don't. You really don't think twice about it. It's just what everyone's a, doing. There's a billion dollar ad and marketing uh, industry <laughs> brainwashing you. Oh yeah, and you want to know the sad thing about it is that um, I do that kind of writing for a living. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not like I'm, uh, you know, unaware of it, and so it, you know. But I just feel like. Sure, creature comforts feel good, and you're making a certain amount of money, and that's you know that it's yeah. I think you're right. It's just kind of un unconscious, and it it felt right at the time, but I think all along I knew you know because it was getting out of hand, and we were just part of it was you know you start to have some debt too, and that was that for me. I think even. Before the tiny home thing, even before the downsizing, I think the main thing is that being free of debt has got to be more liberating than any of this stuff because I think that's another it weighs thing. you down, right? Oh, I think that's part, you know, that's another norm in this country is that people have credit card debt. People assume that mortgage debt is is just what grown-ups do and I I totally don't buy into that anymore. So, um yeah. Well, I am very happy that you've joined the light side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um from tiny house to gypsy in the future, yeah. hopefully I'll be interviewing you about your gypsy life. <laughs> I, like I said, I do feel like there's there's more to come. I do feel like there's I'm kind of at a crossroads and and there's more. Um, I, I've learned so much about myself and what I need and you know what our wants and what our needs and and what I want from life and and I'm feeling really energized about what the next uh, endeavor is going to be and probably five years from that it'll be different as well and I think that's the exciting thing about being open-minded to what your life can be is that you know you don't know you just if you're open to it and you're open to changing and being conscious about those choices you make there's they're really exciting possibilities well I think that's absolutely awesome Jackie and actually you don't know in general and people pretend that they know you know you could work at the same nine to five job every single day of your life and then get hit by a car or something right so you're just more open to what's um the unknown that's out there whereas maybe some people they think they're in a safety net but what they're living isn't really that safe actually right right, right. and I try so hard to be conscious and and be present and mindful of each day. And even when you're trying, it is so hard. You get <laughs> It is. You get sucked in, right? <laughs> yeah, you get caught up by deadlines and um, things that you have to do and places you have to be and, and, you know, people you should call and emails you should return and all those things. It's really hard to be present. And so it's, some, it's something I'm really trying to work on for myself. Um, so, yeah. So, um, you said your husband's an electrician. Is mm -hmm. he going to be part of this gypsy life? And how does he find work as an electrician, a traveling electrician? Yeah. Well, we're working on the financial independence part. And um, he's been working back on the land a lot. So, he, um, we're here, but he spends a lot of time trying to get things more livable there. Um, so, we'll have to see. Um, I, I know that my work is 
is is more tra- freelance, yeah, right? More free, <laughs> yeah, travel, travelable. Um, so either he quits and comes with us, or he stays and meets up with us here and there. Or um, he, he's less of a nomad than I am. So we'll we'll okay. see how that goes. <laughs> we'll do you mm-hmm. do you feel like the challenges of kind of uprooting your life and and moving it around or changing things around has made your family and your marriage stronger or has it just been a challenge? I mean, it seems like you guys are going through all these new adventures together. So that's a positive. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I would say it bo- it's both. It puts huge pressures on, on you because especially being out, you know, in the middle of nowhere, it's really just us. And you really find out what you're, you know, what <laughs> You really what you're made of <laughs> yeah, exactly, and um, you really get to know a person way more than you ever thought you would. Right? So it's really it's it's definitely a challenge. Um, I do feel like it it's bring it, there are experiences we've had that nobody else will understand, that's, <laughs> right? And that's something that binds us together for the rest of our lives, you know. Um, so it really. Um, I, I, I do worry for my kids about moving around and, um, about having a sense of home and, you know, I, I grew up in my same home in Waukegan, Illinois, and I, I still go home to my home in Waukegan, Illinois, and it's the same house I grew up in and my, you know, my parents are there and it feels like home. And so I wonder if my kids, what, what home will mean to them. You know, and I, I, it's more of an intangible sense of people as opposed to place for them, I'm sure. Um, but Well, things, things change as well, too. You know, you can go back to a city that right. 20, years, 20 years later, and it looks totally different and feels yeah, different. Yeah, so. right, right, definitely. I think what, it, what really it does is just, you know, it makes you, I'm hoping I'm making really hearty, adventurous creative kids character driven yeah. kids right yeah, exactly <laughs> and well they- they'll definitely be mm-hmm. it's the most interesting among their friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're they're really hearty kids i'm really proud of them they've been through they've been through a lot and they are they are tough cookies so i know that well, that's really cool. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Um, your blog is postconsumerlife.com. Where else can people find you online or find out more information if they're interested in having this really fun, cool new life? Oh, well, you're welcome to, like you said, on my blog, postconsumerlife.com. And I suppose if anyone would like to email, I'm Jackie, J-A-C-K-I at JackiePaper.com. Okay, and your website is JackiePaper.com too? or uh, It's PostConsumerLife.com. Okay, that's just your private email. Right. Okay, and um, hopefully we'll be hearing from you in the future about your fun new adventures. Right. <laughs> Rosie, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me about this and find that it's interesting <laughs> enough to talk about. <laughs> I really enjoyed talking with you, and thanks for your really fun questions. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. Guys, go on outoftheboxpodcast.com and click on the donate button. We are now accepting Litecoins and Bitcoins and your donations help keep the podcast going. As always, we are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. And if you click on the subscribe button, that makes us so happy. And we also love positive comments. If you enjoy the podcast, go on iTunes and leave positive comments. We love them. We appreciate them. And as always, our sponsor, HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, hug me tease. Guys, this has been Rosie Tran with Out of the Box Podcast. 